All right, good morning. Happy Mother's Day to you moms. You are the best. Um, we're going to be in Luke chapter 9 this morning, Luke 9. Um, we're going to be picking up in verses, uh, verse 37. And as we continue our verse-by-verse study through the Gospel of Luke, all I have to say is, wow, did we land on an incredible Mother's Day passage today. Our passage centers on a child that is demon-possessed. So great. I don't know, maybe, maybe moms, you'll go, at least my kid's not that bad. Or, you know, I guess my problems could be a lot worse, or maybe at least I'm not the only one. I don't know. <laughs> Uh, no, but I do believe there's something for all of us to grab hold on, uh, hold of here in the scripture. In this portion is, it's filled with honesty, it's filled with hardship, even heartache, uh, which I'm sure many in this room maybe have dealt with or are dealing with even today. And but there's good news, right? There's good news. We see that when we are helpless and all hope seems lost. There's Jesus, amen? He can intercede and he can come to our rescue. Let's get right into our passage, but first, pray with me. Lord, thank you so much for your love and thank you for moms, Lord, I do agree. And I thank you for those, those moms who have little ones in heaven waiting for them, Lord, and um, God, just the joy, Lord, that, that they did their job, Lord. And um, Lord, I also just thank you, God, that, that you're with every single parent, Lord, that, that we can just cry out to you, Lord, as we'll see in our passage, and, and you, Lord, can work in our hearts and our lives, and people who are going through things, tough decisions, tough situations, Lord, I, I believe, Lord, that you are the answer, and I ask right now that you would do great and awesome things as we open up your word, and Lord, that you would truly just use this time, Lord, um, for your glory. Lord, help us to respond, Lord, challenging, challenging passage, but Lord, we know that, Lord, challenges are good sometimes, <laughs> and I pray that we leave here inspired, Lord, to trust you. In Jesus' name, Amen. So begin with me in verse 37 of chapter 9. Luke writes, Now it happened on the next day, when they had come down from the mountain, that a great multitude met him, Jesus. Verse 38, Suddenly a man from the multitude cried out, saying, Teacher, I implore you, look on my son, for he is my only child. And behold, a spirit seizes him, and he suddenly cries out. It convulses him, so that he foams at the mouth, and it departs from him with great difficulty, bruising him. So I implored your disciples to cast it out, but they could not. Then Jesus answered and said, O faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you and bear with you? Bring your son here. And as he was coming, still coming, the, the demon threw him down and convulsed him. Then Jesus rebuked the unclean spirits, healed the child, and gave him back to his father. And they were all amazed at the majesty of God. Let's stop right there. I mean, it does end incredibly, but most of the scene is heartbreaking, right? As we, we read of a father crying out in desperation for his possessed son's deliverance. I find it so interesting. So far in the Gospel of Luke, we've seen a mother broken for her son. Maybe you can recall the widow at Nain whose son uh, uh, Jesus raised. We've studied a father who is in great despair for his daughter, Jairus, the ruler of the synagogue. Jesus touches the little girl and restores her back to life. But now we read of a father who comes seeking help for his son in the most tragic and overwhelming circumstance. Mother, son, father, daughter, now father, son. Different relationships, Each devastating situation was distinct, but the answer was the same. The answer was Jesus. In this room this morning, mothers, fathers, grandmas, grandpas, married, single, each one of our situations might be different, but the answer for any devastating circumstance is the same as back then. (laughs) The answer is Jesus. Amen. And the great encouragement for us all this morning is to look to Jesus, to cry out to him in our greatest times of need, because Jesus is the one who has the power and the compassion to work in our lives. Let's go back to the top and glean all we can from this intense yet incredible passage. Verse 37 says, Now it happened on the next day, when they had come down from the mountain, that a great multitude met him. Now for those of you who were here last week, remember what happened on the mountain? (laughs) 
Well, let's start off with Peter and James and, and John sawing logs during a prayer meeting, right? Many of you know all about that. But, um, but even though they were zonked out, that time of prayer was powerful, wasn't it? Possibly the most glorious of all time. Because as Jesus prayed, he was transfigured, metamorphosized. He was radiating in glory. His face was shining like the sun. Jesus was emitting light like lightning. You know, I still love the Mark's description of Jesus' clothes. He's saying it was, they were whiter than any laundered garments. Like, tied with bleach, got nothing on how bright Jesus was shining. I love it. But this is where Jesus' true nature was revealed. Before it was covered by humanity. His eternal majesty, it came through on the mountain. And then, of course, some infamous visitors show up. Moses and Elijah, they come and talk about Jesus' mission. But also God the Father's presence in the form of a cloud like the Old Testament Shekinah glory descends and consumes the whole area. That scene was all things glorious, righteous, holy, and magnificent. This scene that occurred the very next day, Luke tells us, was all things opposite that. This scene was dark. It was unholy, and it's heartbreaking. Luke uses the phrase, when they, came, when they had come down from the mountain. I think that's important because it reveals the fallen world we live in is different than the glory where we believers are headed. <laughs> you know, up on the mountain was a taste of the kingdom of heaven and how wonderful things will be. In verse uh, 27 of chapter 9, Jesus says, but I tell you truly, there are some standing here who shall not taste death till they see the kingdom of God, the glorious kingdom. They got to see a preview. Peter, James, and John got to see a preview of what it will be like. And remember, Peter didn't want to leave. He didn't want to leave. He was like, Lord, let's stay here. Let's stay here on the mountain. James, John, and I, we will build tabernacles. We will build dwelling places for you, Moses, and Elijah, and we will serve you. Let's just not go down. Let's stay up here. And of course, the father comes and rebukes Peter. But it was so wonderful. It was so immac immaculate. It was so thrilling. Peter didn't want it to end. Can I remind you, <laughs> where we Christians are going, what we have to look forward to will be so wonderful, so immaculate, so thrilling, and it will never end. <laughs> You know, I crack up when people think, like, oh, heaven is going to be so, like, boring, right? We're just going to be singing songs, like, playing harps on clouds. Is that all heaven's going to be like? No, heaven is going to be rocking. <laughs> it's going to be amazing. I don't know if you've ever just experienced, like, a time of worship, and you have this moment where you, like, you feel like you are touching heaven. Like, you are just, like, it's just like God meets you. He fills you. That's what it's going to be like for all eternity. And, you know, maybe you hear someone singing, you're like, they sing like an angel, we are going to be singing with angels. This is going to be amazing. And there will be the most exciting reunions for those who go before us in the Lord. Also, you know, all the wickedness and heartbreaking things we see and have to deal with here, gone, gone. You know, regarding society, you know, Mr. I want to build tents and stay here forever, he wrote that we will inherit a place that is incorruptible and undefiled and that does not fade away, reserved for us in heaven. <laughs> How good is that? You know, for our personal lives, John 14, Jesus says, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. And we might think like Bel Air, but this might be talking about our bodies. <laughs> that means no more creaks and pain. <laughs> Gone. We'll be radiating. Plus, Revelation chapter 21 tells us that every tear will be wiped away from our eyes. No more sadness or crying or pain. And no more death. No more sin. No more spiritual attacks or tragic situations. We will be in the presence of the Lord forever. <laughs> Psalm 16 states, there will be fullness of joy and pleasures forevermore. Sounds good, right? <laughs> That's what we have to look forward to. That's what's up on the mountain but we're not there yet. <laughs> I think some of us, us forget that as well. We think that it should be all like that. It's not like that. <laughs> we are down <laughs> from the mountain. Down from the mountain is the world we live in. Because of sin, our world has fallen. 
there are hardships and heartache, and there is a real enemy who wants to destroy the lives of all image bearers. That's the reality. And we read about one horrific attack in our passage. In verse 37, now it happened on the next day when they had come down from the mountain that a great multitude met him, met Jesus. You know, as usual, people were flocking to Jesus to see him. There were crowds and crowds of people. Mark actually gives us a bit more description in his, in his account. He says, as Jesus was approaching down from the mountain, he sees a great multitude surrounding the disciples which wouldn't include, would not include Peter, James, and John because they were with Jesus, but the other nine. But the huge crowd was, was closing in on the other nine, and we're also told there were scribes, religious rulers, arguing with the disciples. And as Jesus arrives, he says to the scribes, he says, what's going on? He says, tell me what you're arguing with my disciples about. Jesus came to their defense. I love that. He will always come to our defense as well. But they are clearly arguing about the tragic situation of the story, which now is brought right to Jesus in verse 38, where it says, Suddenly, a man from the multitude cried out, saying, Teacher, I implore you, look on my son, for he is my only child. And behold, a spirit seizes him, and he suddenly cries out. It convulses him so that he foams at the mouth, and it departs from him with great difficulty, bruising him or breaking him. Verse 40, so I implored your disciples to cast it out, but they could not. I mean, this situation is awful. This is heartbreaking. This desperate man brought his son here looking for answers, hoping he could be set free, but nothing's working. The religious rulers couldn't do anything, and the disciples were unsuccessful as well. But of course, dad is the most frantic and distraught. Again, verse 38, suddenly a man from the multitude cried out. He, he exclaimed, he, he shouted, saying, teacher, I implore you, I'm pleading, I'm begging you. He says, look on my son, for he is my only child. I mean, obviously his words indicate it, but imagine how helpless he must have felt. Place yourself in this position. The last two days I did. <laughs> <laughs> and it wrecked me. It wrecked me. I couldn't even hold myself together the first service. And I think it's because I'm a dad with boys, and I couldn't imagine having this happen to one of them. And honestly, I, I'll just be candid, I am in this season where I'm having fun. <laughs> I'm having so much fun. I'm like, my kids are all getting into sports right now, like, like more than ever, and it's like we're, we're playing sports, they're watching sports, I'm working with them, it is like the most awesome thing. My, my, it's so cool, my oldest son, who's 13 now, he's my height, he's going to be much taller than me, and he's faster than me, shh, don't tell him, I'm not going to admit it, but he's all into baseball right now, and, and I play baseball, so you know, I'm, we're, I'm loving it, and you know, it's, it's at this point where, I don't know if, if you guys have experienced it, but it's like, when, you're, when you're, you're playing catch with your kid and you have to go like, Ooh, like, don't, don't hit him. You know, like, that's what, for years, it was like, a, now we're, like, gunning at each other. Like, how hard can you throw him back? Man, I'm throwing it at him. Like, this is awesome, you know? And we're, we're, we're in it, and, and we're constantly working on batting and fielding. It's, it's amazing. And every so often, you know, I, I think back. I think back at that, that night that he was born. And I remember being in the hospital, and we had to go into the nursery at the hospital shortly after it was born. It was probably like one o'clock in the morning, and I don't think there was another baby in there. Actually, th it could have been full, but all I saw was one child, right? <laughs> he grabbed all my attention, all my affection, you know, that instant love. But I remember looking at him and thinking, well, first, I can't believe I'm responsible for you. It's number one thing. <laughs> but then I remember going, I'm going to do everything, everything I can to be there for you. I'm going to do everything I can to protect you so nothing or no one will ever harm you. I probably made some ridiculous promises that I could never keep. And I just have to think, what did this man think when he first held this child <laughs> for the first time? What are you going to be when you grow up? <laughs> what promises did, did he make this child? How different did life turn out for them than that moment he first saw him? What's this man experiencing? What's, what's he feeling? How exhausted this is real. You know, what he's going through, seeing his only son constantly being tormented, and there's nothing he can do. 
This man can't, you know, go work on the kid's baseball swing. He can't go watch an action movie with him. He, he can't even hold a conversation and teach him life lessons. He can't embrace him and say, it's going to be okay, because it's not. His son is tormented, and as a dad, he is completely helpless. And personally, I, I wonder, as I studied the different passages, I'm, I'm like, where's mom? Where's mom in this? Where's his wife? I find his words interesting that he refers to his son as my son and my only child. You know, there's no other kids in the picture. She's not taking care of other kids back at home. Where's she? We're not told. But I wondered, has tragedy already struck this family? <laughs> Did she pass away? Or were things so intense, she's like, I can't take it, and, and, le and left. Too hard to deal with. Is this dad all alone? Is he a single parent raising this child alone? Some in this room <laughs> might be in that state. And the other thing is we assume that this child is young, but in Mark, the man is asked by Jesus, how long has this been happening to, to his son? And his response is from childhood. He could be seven, could be eight, could be nine, but he could also be in his teens. And this suffering could have been occurring for years. I do wonder, how many times did the dad cry out, why? Why is this happening to our, my family? Why is this happening? What am I going to do? I don't know what to do. And whether our kids are young or grown, <laughs> have any of us parents had that same reaction? <laughs> whether it's health issues or relationship tension or the heaviness of heart because a child has chosen to pursue this world instead of Christ. Why is this happening? I don't know what to do. Many of us have had helpless thoughts. Some have had maybe hopeless thoughts. And of course, what's occurring in this situation is terrifying. We read here in verse 39, an evil spirit sees this. It grabs hold of the boy. It makes the child scream. He begins to foam at the mouth. It's so violent, Luke says the boy is left bruised. It could also be translated broken. He's, he, he breaks him. Mark adds, he gets thrown to the ground, gnashes his teeth, becomes rigid or curled up on the floor, and is often thrown into a fire or into water. Are there sores, are there burns on this child? This satanic spirit is trying to destroy this precious life. Nothing has changed. <laughs> you know, people downplay Satan you know, by trying to make him like this fictitious character with a pitchfork cape and, you know, horns. And sometimes flippantly saying things like, you know, Satan is like the cool rebel. I can't wait to party it up in hell with him. Me and my buddies. You know, because they don't believe in the reality of it. But he is real. He is completely wicked. And he and his minions are on a mission to destroy lives. The Bible calls him the evil one, a murderer, the enemy, the ruler of this world, God of this age, lowercase g, by the way, liar, father of lies, deceiver, the tempter, who disguises himself as an angel of light and roars like a lion, seeking who may, he may devour. And his influence is rampant. It's running rampant. The temptation and deception he throws at everyone, but especially young people nowadays, is disastrous. I mean, what, 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 what is he telling them? That this world has something to offer, that it can bring satisfaction to your life. We all know it's not true. Think about the identity issues that kids are dealing with, all that's being thrown at them, the, 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 the false sense of purpose. What, what's this world about? What's this life about? There's so much confusion. How many tragic stories do we hear regarding substance abuse in young ages and depression and bullying and, worst of all, suicides? You know, the, the statistics are overwhelming. I read during the first 10 months of COVID, it was estimated that over 5,500 youth ages 5 to 24 committed suicide. In 2023, more than 20% of teens have seriously considered suicide. And the reason was because they, they, they were feeling sad because they were feeling lonely and hopeless. 
You know, how many carry the thought, the world is better off without me? How many carry that? It's heartbreaking. And I, I, I read that 10 to 12% of the LGBTQ youth have attempted, uh, in 2023, attempted suicide. The deception, the confusion. Times are tough, and, and though many of us are not going to deal with kids being possessed, the enemy's tactic is the same. He wants to bring confusion, and he wants to destroy lives. And I, I'm going to say this. Us parents, we need to be involved. We need to interact constantly. We need to affirm their value as precious image bearers of God, patiently lead them to the truth, and help them to understand and believe that God loves them and that he has a beautiful plan for their life, not what this world is saying what this is saying. The greatest thing we can do is to take them to Jesus <laughs> because he is the answer and he is powerful and full of compassion. He is a very present help in our times of need. He can be a very present help in their time of need too. And we see, we see with this man, this man comes in his time of greatest need. He cries out to Jesus. He begs him to help as he describes the horrible things happening to his son and how the disciples couldn't do anything. But before Jesus does deli de deliver the boy, which we read, he does, Jesus makes a very interesting statement, a very intense statement. Verse 41, then Jesus answered and said, O faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you and bear with you? He says to bring your son here. I mean, th this sounds a bit br brutal, right? <laughs> it's a little like, what happened to Jesus? Like, you know, did he wake up on the wrong side of the mountain? He probably didn't get any sleep. He's traveling down the mountain. Was he like, you know, oh, it was so much better on the mountain with Elijah and Moses in glory. My father was there. Why do I have to deal with these fallen people? Annoying. <laughs> but no, he's, he's more grieved than annoyed. That they were faithless. They were not believing and perverse, meaning they were crooked or twisted or their, their thinking was off. It was, their behavior was off. Whose? The whole generation. <laughs> Does that include the crowd? Yes. Does it include the critical religious rulers? Yes. I mean, even the dad. Maybe he came to a place where he's thinking, you know, it's never going to happen. It's been so long. We've tried everything. Nothing is going to work to deliver my son. Thoughts we might be tempted to believe as well. Talk about more about the Father and Jesus' interaction. But the real offenders were the, were the disciples, who we read couldn't do anything. And really, they should have been able to. At the beginning, you might recall this, at the beginning of chapter 9, Jesus gave them power and authority over, quote, all demons, all demons, all means, all, all demons, and the power to cure diseases. And yet here, they weren't able to deliver the child. Matthew and Mark state, after this whole incident concludes, the disciples ask Jesus why they weren't able to cast out the demon. Jesus tells them two things. He says, first, in Matthew, Jesus says, it's because of their unbelief, their lack of faith. And then he adds that this kind does not come out except by prayer and fasting, this kind of what? This kind of spirit. But this reveals their faith was misplaced, and it reveals that their dependence on the Lord has shifted. You know, I, I kind of read it, and I, I, I think, listen, look, listening to their question, looking at the, the, the different um, accounts, they did have some sort of belief. <laughs> Even their question kind of shows it. They, they would ask, why couldn't we do it? As in, we've done it before. <laughs> why didn't it work this time? They thought, they believed, they could do it. Their problem was they were trusting the method instead of trusting the Lord. They had faith in delivering instead of faith in the deliverer. And I think people do the same thing today. People do the same thing today. They say, you know, I'm just going to believe my situation will get better, and it will. I will have faith that I am going to be healed, and I will be healed. I will have positive thoughts, and then my thoughts will become the reality. Now, let me say this, though. I will say it is better. I'll even say it's healthy. 
to have an optimistic perspective in life. It, it is. I mean, instead of a pessimistic, like, Eeyore kind of mentality, you're just asking for detrimental health if that's the way you live. But when it comes to faith, when it comes to faith, the object we place our faith in matters. And that is to be Jesus. We are not to generally believe. Just believe and believe. No. Not to have faith in the method. That's what the disciples did. We are to have faith in Jesus. They thought they could do it without him. But boy, were they were all right. <laughs> without him, we could do nothing. Which leads to Jesus' comment about the necessity to pray and fast to cast out this demon. And maybe this was a more powerful demon than the others, but he says prayer and fasting was needed. And I don't know, I mean, Peter wasn't part of this group at that scene who, who, missed, who, who couldn't do it. So maybe another <laughs> disciple, I'm thinking Thomas, the doubter, maybe ha- could be thinking, you know, I get praying, right? I get, we got to take it to the Lord prayer, I got it. But fasting... How would we have had time to fast? <laughs> With, it, it, it just came. How would we have time? This happened all of a sudden. What were we going to do? Say, okay, well, stay right here. We're going to go for a couple days. Go fast. Come back and deal with it. They're like, I, 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 well, I, that doesn't make sense. It does make sense. Because it shows us that engaging in prayer and fasting, it wasn't just a, a random thing. It wasn't just like a one-time skip a meal kind of thing. It speaks of a continual commitment and dependence upon the Lord. The maintaining of consistent spiritual dedication where where there was constant communication with the Lord. That's what was necessary to be in tune with Him. It's like like exercise, right? (laughs) We love to exercise, don't we? But it's like exercise, right? It's like exercise. You know, if you want to be, and eating right, if you want to be healthy, exercising is good, eating healthy is good, right? If you want to be physically healthy, you you, you can't really be physically healthy if you lay around all day, like for six months, and you eat like pizza, popcorn, and ice cream all the time, and then once every six months, you eat a salad, and you get on the treadmill, and go, look at me, I'm healthy. That would be awesome, I think, if we could do that. But no, to stay physically healthy, what do you have to do? You have to consistently live that way, right? We need to exercise our spiritual muscles. Prayer and fasting speak of a consistent action of dedication to to stay spiritually healthy. You know, communing with the Lord through prayer and fasting, making sacrifices to seek the Lord, will keep us spiritually strong. And we're like, I get prayer. Do we do it? Probably not, but (laughs) I get prayer. I get I seek the Lord, but the fasting part, oh, Really? And and technically, yes, fasting is the refraining from meals. But it's not just to be like, oh, I'm refraining from meals so I can just suffer and be hungry. (laughs) That's not the reason we do it. We refrain from meals so that we will be be spending that time with the Lord. That maybe even that the hunger pains will remind us, oh, I should be praying again. That's why we do it. We don't do it just to be miserable. No, we we fast. We fast because we want to draw closer to the Lord. Because we need to seek his will, and we're going to dedicate ourselves more and more. Like, I'm not even going to have time to eat because I'm going to be focusing on the Lord. I will say, though, culturally, it took a long time for them to prepare meals, right? <laughs> we could just throw that something in the microwave. We'll be done right away. So, I mean, it's like, I feel like, yes, we should fast food. It should remind us. But I think our culture, we need to be fasting some other stuff. <laughs> and, you know, that might be our hobbies, That might be some news. (laughs) Dare I say, put down the phone and get off social media for a little bit? I think sometimes we need to do that. Why? To dedicate ourselves more to the Lord, to to get in tune with Him. Jesus was telling them to be effectively used. It was a matter of dedication and faith. I think that's a great application for us. If we want to be used effectively for the Lord, we must place our faith in the right source, Jesus, Jesus, and be spiritually in tune and dependent upon him. I, I don't really feel like the, the passage is about de- demon deliverance. <laughs> like, how do we set up our, our ministry, you know, meeting every Wednesday night? No, we're not doing that. This is about faith. It's about our commitment, which needs to be the priority for all Christians. Amen? <laughs> 
And after Jesus says these words, mainly I believe to his disciples, we read Jesus say to the Father, bring your son here. Verse 42, and as he was still coming, the demon threw him down and convulsed him. Again, Mark, he really adds a lot in his, in his description, the most. He adds, he adds um, more detail. He writes, then they brought him, the boy, to him, to Jesus. Listen, listen to this. And when he saw him, when he, the, the, the demon inside the child, saw Jesus, it says, immediately the spirit convulsed him, and he fell on the ground and wallowed, foaming at the mouth. You know, it's almost like this, this powerful demon is taunting. Maybe going, look what I can do to people. They stand no chance against me. Well, however the powerful the demon is, it stands no chance against Jesus. <laughs> but it's so interesting. Before the deliverance, Mark includes a real, honest, and emotional encounter between Jesus and the boy's father. As, as dad is undoubtedly, I mean, this, this happened, this is real. This is happening right in front of him. The, 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 the demon overtakes him again. He's convulsing. He's on the ground, foaming at the mouth. Dad's looking. As dad's looking upon this, Jesus asks him, how long has he been going through this? How long has this been going on? He said, from childhood, a long time. And that's where he adds, the spirit often throws him into the fire or water, trying to destroy him. But now the father likely looking at Jesus he pleads again, and he says to Jesus, if you can do anything, have compassion, have mercy, even pity, have pity on us and help us. He is begging. He is at his end. Matthew, at the beginning of this account, says he came kneeling to Jesus, kneeling before Jesus. I don't think he got up. <laughs> kneeling down. Can you do anything? And Jesus then says to this desperate man, he says, if you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. And then comes one of the most honest replies we have in Scripture. Mark says, immediately the father of the child cried out and said with tears, tears, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. Say, I, I believe, but it's hard. I'm hanging by a thread. I've been hanging by a thread for a long time. <laughs> Tried everything. I know you can, but I need help even believing you can. How many of us have been in that place? How many of us are there? Maybe it's a child, young or old. Maybe it's a, a, a trial. Maybe it's health. Maybe it's financial. Maybe it's a relationship. Lord, I believe you can do it. I believe you can do it. But I need help believing that you can do it. It's real. It's real. I love God's word. I love God's word because it's real. There are beautiful promises. There are some of the most inspiring things that we have, but this is real. And what the life that we are living is real. But what we are to do is go to Jesus. And Jesus is so good. He is so good. He is so compassionate. He can help us in our desperation, even if we're hanging by a thread, like he does this desperate man. And I believe leaving here, that's what we need to believe. That's what we need to believe. Our faith, our dependence, it needs to be placed in him no matter what comes our way. <laughs> and Jesus, I mean, he is, you see how good he is, right? <laughs> you know, you're hearing. He doesn't go like, help my, um, the Father, help my unbelief. He doesn't go, no, <laughs> I'm not going to do it. Too bad. Why don't you come back when your faith increases a little bit? No. With this man's little mustard seed faith, that is just enough to show up, just enough to fall down before Jesus, and just enough to ask him to help was enough. <laughs> and then Jesus, it says, and keep going, verse 42, rebuked the unclean spirit, healed the child, and gave him back to his father. <laughs> I love it. 
Mark tells us more again. He's very detailed. He rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, deaf and dumb spirit, I command you, come out of him and enter him no more. Then the spirit cried out, convulsed him greatly, and came out of him, and he became as one dead, so that many said, he is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand, lifted him up, and he arose. That's what God's word says. And Luke again, Jesus healed the child and gave him back to his father. (laughs) I love that line, back to his father. He gave him back to his father. (laughs) But his father got his son back. (laughs) Uh, What was that like? What was it like? Years of torment, years of exhaustion, loneliness, brokenness, questions, not understanding. The father has a son back. You know what? He could finally embrace him. He could finally embrace him and say, it's okay. It's okay because now it is. (laughs) Because it says the spirit never to return again. It ain't coming back. <laughs> Close shop. It can't come back. I find this awesome. Verse 43, and they, the crowd, were all amazed at the majesty of God. I should say so. <laughs> majesty, that's his magnificence, his glory. You know, it's so fascinating. One other time, this word, majesty, is used for Jesus. In 2 Peter chapter 1, and guess where that is? That is when Peter talks about what happened on the mountain, <laughs> where he says this. He says, For we did not follow cunning devised fables when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty, same word, of his magnificence. For he received from God the Father honor and glory when such a voice came to him from the excellent glory. You know what I love? Is on the mountaintop or in the valley, Jesus is the same, (laughs) and he is always powerful. But while everyone marveled at all these things, which Jesus did, he said to his disciples, let these words sink down into your ears. He says, for the Son of Man is about to be betrayed into the hands of men. But they did not understand the saying, and it was hidden from them so that they did not perceive it, and they were afraid to ask him (laughs) about this saying. It's like, why does he do that? Why does he do that? This moment, and then he says this. Why? Everyone's marveling. Why does he do this? He does this. He tells them this because this is why he came. Jesus came. He did miraculous things. He, he healed. He will heal today. He can do incredible things, but his mission is to save. His mission, if you'll let me say it this way, is to take us to the mountaintop. One day that will happen. But the only way that we will make it to the heavenly mountaintop, if you will, <laughs> is because he went, upon, went to the cross for us in our place. It's the only way. I think that's why he says it. That's, that's why he came. Sure, great things happen. Show who he is. But his mission was to save us from eternal separation from the Father. But you know what? He will be with us in the valleys. He will. I hope you believe that. I hope you believe that he will be with you in the valley. What do we take from this? I think we take our faith has to be placed in Jesus. If you don't believe in him, what do you got? What is this world offering you? Faith in Jesus is what it's all about. (laughs) You know, it's not faith in, you know, the method. I just want to believe that I'm healed and I'll be healed. You will be healed one day. (laughs) He might choose to do it here. But one day you will be radiating in glory. (laughs) When you are forever with him in that place, there's fullness of joy and pleasures forevermore. An inheritance that is incorruptible, undefiled, and does not fade away, where he will wipe every tear from your eye. No more pain, no more sorrow, no more sickness, no more death. That's what's coming for us. I think we need to know that. One more exor- exor- exhortation. Not exorcism. <laughs> Verse 44. Verse 
Parents, I believe Jesus wants to do what, what, we, saw, what we see here, what, we, what, I, what I said, what I read in Mark, and that's raise up our kids. Have his hand upon our kids. Raise them up. But you know what? He has placed us in that role as their parents to raise them, to be an example to them, to fight for them. And I think the greatest way we fight for them is when our faces are on the floor. <laughs> I believe he has the power to bring the prodigal home. I believe he has the power to protect our, our children in Babylon 2024. <laughs> I'm, kinda, I'm, kinda, I'm, I'm one of those weird people. I'm totally weird. I, you guys know this. I'm totally weird. But I don't, I think they can make it. I think they can make it. I believe that they can make it. I believe that with all my heart they can make it. And that's why I'm not moving to Alabama. Because <laughs> Because they can make it in Los Angeles, California, 2024 on. And why do I know that? Because we see it. We see it. <laughs> Remember Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Remember them? They made it in Babylon. <laughs> they did. But you know what's interesting? We know Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, right? Do you know that's not their real names? What? <laughs> that's their Babylonian names that were given to them. They had different names. Shadrach's name, Hananiah. You know what that means? Yahweh has been gracious. Meshach's name, Mishael, means who is what God is. Abednego is, was Azariah. It means Yahweh is my helper. <laughs> Their leader, Daniel, Daniel. <laughs> God is my judge. Where did they get those names? They got those names from mom and dad. <laughs> mom and dad knew what they were doing. <laughs> what happened to mom and dad? We don't know what happened to ma mom and dad. They could have died when the Babylonian um, siege took place and all the kids, all those kids were taken to Babylon. But you know what? Those four, they made it. <laughs> those four were dedicated to the Lord, even in Babylon. Our kids can make it. And this, this passage, it, it hit me. You know, because you guys hear stories about pastor's kids, right? <laughs> oh, boy, pastor's kids. But I believe pastor's kids can make it, too. I believe all our kids can make it. But, you know, we got to lead the way. We got to lead the way, parents. We got to do it. How exhausted was this dad? How exhausted was he? Exhausted. Exhausted. But he did everything he could to get his son to Jesus. And Jesus worked, right? I don't, I don't know. I mean, like, for those of us who have younger kids, are, <laughs> I have a question. Are, are we dragging our kids to church or are they dragging us? <laughs> can we go to church today? I guess we can go to church today. <laughs> that's that's going to that's gonna motivate them <laughs> to follow the Lord, right? You know, what's going to motivate them to, to, to follow the Lord is seeing it, <laughs> seeing faith. Not that you're perfect. I'll admit, I'm not perfect. Really? Yeah, I'm not. I'm not. I know I fooled you all, but I'm not perfect. I'm not the perfect dad. Probably the perfect husband, but not the perfect dad. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Far from it. Now strike, boom, you know, huh? But I, I, I want my kids to see that I believe Jesus with all my heart. And I'm going to make sacrifices in my life because my greatest desire for my family is that they would follow Jesus, that they would belong to him and live for him. You know, it's great. I, I love, I love that, you know, we can emphasize schooling and like, yeah, college or whatever. <laughs> Never, maybe not college, but, you know, like, sorry. Um, but, you know, whatever their future is, education. Or, you know, like, yeah, would I love my son to be a center fielder on the Los Angeles Dodgers? Yes, that would be fantastic. And I'm working hard so he can, no, I'm not working that hard. 
But greater than anything is for them to know and walk with Jesus. Because that's going to have the eternal meaning. Eternal. Yes, things are important. Yes. But you know what? They got to see it in me. They got to see it in me, Mom. And I got to bring them to Jesus constantly. I, I, you know, it was so funny. I, 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 when, I, when I stepped into this role and, you know, it was a year before COVID hit. And, it, you know, I, the one thing I said to the pastor before, he, I said, you know, I, I just can't lose my family. I can't. I can't. I can't lose my family. Because if I lose my family, I'm quitting. Which I think is good, <laughs> by the way. But 2020 hits. And you know what happened, right? <laughs> you got chirp, 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 chirp from all directions, right? This person said, <laughs> and what takes all your attention, all your focus? This, right? I got your family. Let me just deal with this. Then I'll get to you. I mean, I didn't do horrible, but I missed some things, you know? I missed some things. You guys are not my kids. <laughs> I got three awesome boys. And I'm to I'm to lead them. I'm to lead them. I'm gonna do my best here. I'm gonna study. I'm gonna work hard. I'm gonna I'm gonna do what I do. I'm gonna make sacrifices and the family knows we get we make sacrifices, but you know what? Man, I look at those I look at those statistics of pastor son, kids and you know it's like I know my kids can make it. But you know, I know your kids can make it too. But it takes all of us to work hard. And it takes the body. You're like, oh, I don't have, this is what a horrible message for me. I'm single. I don't have to deal with it. You're part of this family. You're part of this family. And you know what? You can pray for them. Pray for them. Get on board. Because parenting nowadays is difficult. And I'm, yeah, I'm laying it on you. You, you just got a responsibility. <laughs> you see someone going through, you see a parent going through it. Man, put your hand on their shoulder. Say, yeah, you need to go to Jesus right now. And I know you're having a hard time. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to take you there. <laughs> I'm going to take you there so that you can take your kids there. (laughs) That's what we're to do. Amen? Lord, we thank you so much for your love, and I just thank you for the power of your word. I thank you for those who believe your your word. And I I thank you, Lord, that we can be a body of believers who trust that, that Jesus is enough and that all our faith and all our dedication and all our devotion and dependence needs to be upon you. Lord, I pray that you'd work in this place. If someone doesn't know you, if they've walked away, if there are a prodigal, or Lord, they're dealing with prodigals, Lord, that all of us would just come and, and rally around each other. Lord, and, and come back to that place where we truly believe that you can work. Lord, our faith is in you. Our faith is not in the method. Our faith is in you and you alone. And so I just pray, God, that you would work in our hearts and our lives. Thank you for this time, Lord. Thank you for the power of your word. And And I do pray for parents in here, Lord, those with young kids, those with older kids, or those who are just in relationship difficulties in general, that you'd work, that you'd restore, that you'd bring peace, you'd save, do the things that you can do, because you are all powerful, and you're full of compassion. We love you. We praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. If you need prayer, like, don't don't be ashamed to pray. We have such a privilege to pray. If you need prayer, grab someone next to you. Grab, you know, one of us up here. Just come before him and see what he can do when you go to him. Amen? God bless you. Let's stand. Let's go out and sing to the Lord.